Podcast 11 of the Pelvis and Perineum series. The Autonomic Nerves of the Pelvis. This podcast is going to outline the autonomic nerves of the pelvis and also detail the mechanisms of micturition and the processes leading up to ejaculation. The autonomic nerves of the pelvis are often confusing and textbooks will often give conflicting answers, so I'll try and make them as simple as possible. It is important though to remember some basic facts about the anatomy of the autonomic nervous system before we begin. So just to remind you, the autonomic nervous system consists of both parasympathetic and sympathetic fibres, and with regard to the spinal cord, sympathetic fibres leave from the thoracic and lumbar segments, whilst the parasympathetic fibres come from S2 to S4 of the sacral segments. It's important not to confuse the parasympathetic fibres of S2 to 4 with the pudendal nerve, which also comes from S2 to 4, but it's a somatic nerve. Remember, we control somatic nerves, and we do not control autonomic nerves. So sympathetic thoracolumbar, parasympathetic S2 to S4, and the somatic pudendal nerve, also S2 to S4. Now, with regard to the pelvic viscera, we are concerned with the bladder and urethral sphincters, external and internal, the male reproductive tract, so the ductus deferens, seminal reticles, prostate and ejaculatory ducts, and in the female there is the uterus and vagina. We also need to be aware of the erectile bodies and their associated muscles when we talk about the processes leading up to ejaculation. With regard to the pelvic viscera, it is important to realise that each of these structures will have a specific plexus associated with them that contains parasympathetic and sympathetic fibres. So there's the prostatic plexus, the uterovaginal plexus, and the vesical plexus. All of these plexuses therefore contain both parasympathetic and sympathetic fibres which control their activity. So the main question is where do the respective parasympathetic and sympathetic fibres come from to form these plexuses? So if we start with the sympathetic, then like I said, sympathetic outflow comes from the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord and gives rise to the thoracic and lumbar splanchnic nerves. These sympathetic splanchnic nerves aggregate on the anterior surface of the aorta to form the superior hypogastric plexus. If you remember from your study of the abdomen, the aorta is littered with plexuses that went on to supply the gastrointestinal tract. Remember the celiac, superior mesenteric and inferior mesenteric plexuses? Anyway, there's a superior hypogastric plexus which surrounds the anterior surface of the aorta at approximately the level of the L3, 4, 5 vertebrae. It is formed from the thoracic and lumbar splanchnic nerves. The superior hypogastric plexus then descends alongside the aorta as it divides into the common iliac arteries. The superior hypogastric plexus also divides following the common iliac arteries as the left and right hypogastric nerves. Remember these are just carrying sympathetic fibres. The left and right hypogastric nerves following the internal iliac artery enter the pelvis. Within the pelvis, they meet parasympathetic fibres to form the inferior hypogastric plexus. This inferior hypogastric plexus is also known as the pelvic plexus. Importantly, we have two of these. As we have a left hypogastric nerve and a right hypogastric nerve, we are going to have the left inferior hypogastric plexus and the right inferior hypogastric plexus. So where do the parasympathetic fibres come from? Well, these come from S2 to S4. They leave the second, third and fourth sacral nerve roots as pelvic splanchnic nerves. These run towards the descending left or right hypogastric nerves and form these inferior hypogastric plexuses. With contributions from both parasympathetic, via the pelvic splanchnics, and sympathetic, by the hypogastric nerves, 
The inferior hypogastric plexus is a mixed plexus, and from it, it gives off the prostatic plexus, the vesical plexus, and the utero-vaginal plexus. So to finish the podcast, let's just focus on a couple of important processes carried out by these autonomic nerves in the pelvis, that is, micturition and the processes that lead to ejaculation. So micturition is the process of passing urine from the bladder to the outside world. It is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, but it also relies on the pudendal nerve, remember that somatic nerve. At rest, when the bladder is filling, the walls of the bladder are gradually being stretched and the internal urethral sphincter is closed. This stretching of the bladder wall is important as it allows the bladder to fill with urine without large increases in vesical pressure. The sensing of the stretch and control of the internal urethral sphincter is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system via the vesical plexus. It is important to remember, however, that the female does not have an internal urethral sphincter, and as we shall see later, in the male, the internal urethral sphincter is important in preventing semen being pushed back into the bladder during ejaculation. During bladder filling, the external urethral sphincter is also closed, this time by the pudendal nerve. So this mechanism of bladder wall relaxation and the closure of the urethral sphincters prevents any leakage of urine from the bladder. So here we have the sympathetic nervous system relaxing the detrusor muscle whilst also contracting the internal urethral sphincter. As the bladder continues to fill, so the increased stretching of the bladder wall is sensed and this causes the parasympathetic fibres to contract the detrusor muscle which pushes the urine through the bladder neck and in the males the internal urethral sphincter relaxes. Urine then enters the proximal urethra. The inferior third of the bladder near the trigon does not contract as this would prevent the urine leaving the bladder neck. The final barrier that the urine has to pass is the external urethral sphincter. This is found within the the urogenital diaphragm of the deep perineal pouch. This skeletal muscle sphincter is controlled by the pudendal nerve from S2 to S4. So for micturition to occur, parasympathetic fibres contract the detrusor muscle, relax the internal urethral sphincter in the male, and the pudendal nerve causes the external urethral sphincter to relax. Urine then passes through the urethra to the external environment. All of these parasympathetic and sympathetic fibres that are controlling the bladder and urethral sphincters are from the vesical plexus. So to finish, let's just detail the processes that lead up to ejaculation, so that's the formation of an erection, emission, and then finally ejaculation. When a male is stimulated erotically, the parasympathetic fibres of the prostatic plexus cause blood to enter the erectile bodies of the penis. Remember these are the corpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum. This allows these bodies to fill with blood and become engorged. At the same time, the muscles surrounding these erectile bodies, the ischiocavernosus, and bulbospongiosus muscles contract to prevent this blood from escaping. So erection formation is via parasympathetic fibres of the prostatic plexus. Next there's emission, and this is where semen is delivered to the prostatic urethra. This is caused by sympathetic fibres, again from the prostatic plexus, which cause the ductus deferens, seminal glands and ejaculatory ducts to contract. Then finally, there is ejaculation, where the semen from the prostatic urethra is expelled from the penis. There is closure of the internal urethral sphincter via sympathetic fibres, and this prevents semen from entering the bladder. The urethra itself contracts under parasympathetic influence, and the bulbospongiosus muscle contracts to expel the semen via the pudendal nerve. So from this arrangement, you can see that the formation of an erection, emission, and then finally ejaculation 
involves all of the autonomic nerve fibres, both parasympathetic and sympathetic, and also the somatic nervous system by way of the pudendal nerve. So in this podcast, I've attempted to outline the main elements of the autonomic nervous system in the pelvis, and detailed how they are involved in both micturition and the processes that lead to ejaculation.